All right, good evening. Job 30. We're almost done with all the, all the whining. Now, what Job's not really whining. I'm being, being silly, but we only have uh, this week and um, next week. And then we're done with what Job has to say. Then we're going to move to Elihu and God. Just a second, these uh, lights are too bright. They were all the way up, and that's too up. We need medium. So, yeah, now I can see it, and uh, I'm not getting a sunburn. So let me pray, and then we'll jump right in to Job's total humiliation. That's, that's what we're going to talk about for the evening. I, that's just the way that goes. <laughs> so, Lord, we thank you for your grace you've shown to us, and we thank you for Jesus and the power of your Spirit that opens our eyes to the truth of your word as well as reveals to us those places we need to turn over to you. And so we pray tonight you would give us hearts of worship that yield to your will and purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I don't know if you uh, did my what I suggested last week when uh, Job was uh, talking about how great his life used to be, because it really is a contrast to chapter 30, which is how his life is now. And and so that's sort of, the way it was written really would have been nice if we could have done it all in one evening, but that would have been really way too much to do. So just to, as a way of reminder, he talked about last time how he would walk into the city gate and all the nobles would stop talking. And when he talked, people listened and he was important and he was recognized and uh, everything in his life uh, was going uh, just peachy. And now he describes in chapter 30 his... Uh, his current suffering. But of course, we, we know a lot about his suffering already. We know, uh, you know, his, his children have died. He had, uh, what, seven sons and three daughters. And uh, his camels were taken, his donkeys were taken, his sheep were taken. Um, a whirlwind destroyed his kid's house. A fire from heaven burned up something, if I remember right. And then, of course, his health has been ruined. And uh, so these are all the, the things of his suffering. But then what he talks about tonight in this particular chapter, he, he gives us a little bit more detail specifically around his physical suffering, his health. But uh, more than that, he talks about the reality that his suffering has put him in a place in society or in his community where he is the lowest, that there's nobody lower than Job. And so that's why... Uh, I sort of wasn't kidding. This is Job's total humiliation, and, and that's what he's describing. It's not just the suffering, but it's the, the humiliation you experience. And, and so I don't know if we can really think of a way to experience this, but maybe there's one occasion you might uh, connect with, which would be if you have to go to the hospital, maybe something's wrong, and then, uh, and then somebody stops by to visit and which, which, if you're alone in the hospital, can be pleasant. But also, it may be somebody that you're not maybe well acquainted with. They want to be polite, and they want to be kind, and they want to greet you and make sure that you're taken care of and encourage you in your illness. But you may, you, you, you know, you're basically living in bed, uh, you know, and you may not feel a little bit uncomfortable. Anybody ever been in that spot where you're, well, I'm not, yeah, I got a sheet on, but I'm not really fully dressed under this sheet. You know, I'm, I'm wearing a gown that is designed to not be modest. And, and, and here I have a person that I'm not really well acquainted with. And then they ask you about, so what's going on? Well, I might not be terribly comfortable telling you what's going on. There might be things going on that are not conversation that I would have with just anybody. And so now on top of your, your illness, you feel a sense of uh, you know embarrassment. And this is sort of what uh, Job is experiencing in his life. He, he's got his suffering, but on top of that is is this shame and humiliation that he's experiencing in front of other people uh, in his community. So there's uh, there's four sections, and, and really we're going to very basic here. We'll look at each of the four sections in turn. And so let me read verses one through eight. His humiliation comes from the worst of sources. Verse one of chapter 30, but now they laugh at me. So remember that, bit, that but there, he's referring back to chapter 29. They used to admire me, 
but now they laugh at me, men who are younger than I, whose fathers I would have disdained to set with the dogs of my flock. What could I gain from the strength of their hands, men whose vigor is gone? Through want and hard hunger, they gnaw the dry ground by night in waste and desolation. They pick salt wort and, leave, and the leaves of bushes and the roots of the broom tree for their food. They are driven out from human company. They shout after them as after a thief. In the gullies of the torrents, they must dwell in holes of the earth and of the rocks. Among the, the bushes, they bray. Under the nettles, they huddle together. A senseless and nameless brood, they have been whipped out of the land. So in these first eight verses, he describes a particular group of people that are mocking him. And it's surprising to some degree uh, who it is. So in verse 1, he's, of course, contrasting the dignity and honor that he used to have. And he used to have that dignity to honor. Remember, he described the people who honored him as the elders and the princes and the nobles. The most important people thought Job was the most important. But now they mock him. And you would sort of expect somebody who falls in a situation like Job is, you would expect the well-to-do to sort of mock him. He no longer fit within the circles of influence because he didn't have wealth or influence anymore. And so he no longer fit. But what's interesting is it's worse than that. It's not just the nobles who ignore him or disdain him or mock him. It's, it's the young idiots. I don't know how to say that nice because that's what he's describing here. Young fools that are, that are mocking him. Job is mocked by those who carry a lineage of waywardness. So that's what we, he says here, they laugh at me, men who are younger than I. So normally in this culture, they, somebody would receive honor by merely being older than you, even if they were not above you in the social strata. An older person still, uh, because in, in, the, in the law, it says you should stand up when an old person or an older person than you comes in. And so these younger people um, laugh at him. Their fathers, he wouldn't have even wanted eating with his dogs. And of course, that, that's really rude. Um, dogs weren't looked well upon in, in their, that culture. And so he, he says, Here, I've got these kids that are living just like their dads are living. So he's not saying there's something wrong with the kids because of their dads. What he's saying is, the dads, I, I, I wouldn't want them around my dogs. They'd mess up my, my dogs. I want my dogs messed up. And the kids are exactly the same as their dads. So that's why I say these kids who are mocking him have this, this lineage of waywardness, of, of wandering, of foolishness. It might be the best way of, of saying it. So he's not being mocked by the nobles and the princes. Now, he probably was at least being ignored by them at this point. But it's, it's the, the people that before he would have not paid two cents towards. They're, they're the ones who now mock him uh, in open chorus. So verse 2, what he does is he says, look, what would I gain from the strength of the, their hands? Men whose vigor is gone. What he's saying is back when I was in my strength, I would have one of these guys, the, either the young guys or their, or their fathers, would have come to me and I said, you don't have anything that I need. You're not providing... I, I can't put you to work in my fields. I can't put you to work with my sheep. I can't put you to work in my, my household. There's nothing you can provide to me that is useful. And, and that's, both a, that, that's really an insult on them because we're going to see next week that Job was the kind of person, if somebody needed something, he took care of him. So if somebody came to him and was willing to put in a hard day's work, Job would have hired him. The problem is, he said, well, what, what am I going to hire you to do? You don't do anything. Uh, and so... When Job was at full strength, these fools, they offered nothing to Job, and now these fools are mocking Job and laughing at him in his time of, of terrible suffering. And verses 3 and 4 describe how these individuals lived. They, they went through want and hard hunger. They gnaw on the ground. They live in waste and desolation. They pick saltwort and leaves of the bushes. So basically what they did is they would forage for food among the foliage of the wilderness. That's how they kept themselves going. 
And you, and you sort of wonder, why is this the case? What land did they live in? Land of the East is what we know, but was the land able to produce food? How do we know that? Because Job had food. Yeah, but what does that require? Uh, well, see, there's the problem. And that's probably our guess with these, is they would rather live uh, sc scavenging for food than have to be tied down to the daily rigors of responsibility. And that's a, of course, none of us like being tied down to the daily. I didn't wake up this morning and say, oh, I'm so happy that I'm chained to the daily rigors of responsibility. But you learn over time that there is some benefit to getting stuff done. And these guys have a lineage of, we just want to hang out. And if we get hungry, we'll, we'll forage for some food in the wilderness. And uh, these guys don't want to be tied down. These really, the first people really want to be totally off-grid. This is off-grid before there was one. That's what these, they just wanted to, wanted to live out. Now, we, we should differentiate here because sort of there's a temptation to say, oh, if you want to see what this looks like, go down to the Greenway. And so there, here's where we would, we, would, we would differentiate between these young fools and maybe the um, homelessness we encounter in our community. Because uh, but, but you're going to have both issues. Number one, we have issues related today to both mental illness and addiction. And those are two very, very complicated challenges. These guys aren't, don't have a, a problem processing reality because of PTSD or anything like that. They're just lazy. Now, I would imagine there might be people who are living on the Greenway that are lazy. There's also people who go to work every day who are lazy. I've worked with some of them. <laughs> and it just turns out they're easier to work than to get fired. Uh, you know, that's the way that corporate sometimes work. So uh, what we might be tempted to say, well, these guys would be uh, um, akin to or parallel to someone today in our culture who is homeless. And maybe there are some, but I think that would be a dangerous parallel to make because not everybody today who is homeless in our culture are because they were lazy. There's other factors. These folks live the way they do because they don't want to be tied down to responsibility, even though they likely have the capacity to handle responsibility. They have that capacity. They just don't want to do it. Like I said, who does? No, but none of us do, but sometimes you just say, you know what, got to get the job done. And these fools are those, they just want to live day by day. And these are the folks who are, who are mocking Job, who really is the example of someone who sought to accomplish things through responsible uh, attention to his duty. One thing in particular we'll make note of this is, remember, what did he do in regard to his children? He was dutiful to seek the Lord's favor for them when they would go into a period of feasting in the event that they had sinned during their feasting. So that's, that's a, we know uh, Job was someone who wanted to dutifully take care of what was his responsibility. These wayward fools have no interest in it. I would imagine, now this is me just imagining, I would imagine if I'm a wayward fool and I just like to scavenge, I might take great delight in seeing this responsible guy finally get his. Does that kind of make sense? Is where you finally say, well, look at it. It didn't pay off for you, bud. You've worked hard your whole life, and now you and I are the same. Yeah, now we're both scavengers. The only difference is you worked your whole life, and I get to play my whole life. You know, so, so I might imagine. Now, the text isn't clear on that, but that's just me sort of interposing sort of my thoughts onto it, and it seems uh, that could be the case. But uh, these are... This is why they live the way they do. You might say, as we look at their diet, which is scavenging for food, you say, well, I'd, only, I'd rather eat bread and milk and honey and all these normal things that come from a, an agricultural diet and, and the occasional fattened calf. And, and, but they would prefer to eat what they do without having to raise the cow. Because if you want to have, have butter on a roll with a steak, you got to grow wheat and grind it. Then you got to bake bread. You got to milk a cow and somehow turn that into butter, which I think involves churning. There's no electricity. So somebody's got to shake a jar of, yeah, or maybe a, a churn. I don't know how they churned back then. But then you got to make that thing. You don't go to Walmart and buy a churn. Somebody's got to figure out how to make a thing to put the milk in to, to shake it. And uh, it, I mean, all of it, does this sound like a lot of work? 
Now you can see why they don't have a steak dinner with rolls all the time. Well, that's what these guys had. Why would I do all that when I can eat from a broom tree? None of these things that they're eating are terribly nutritious or good. They just make, you know, I would imagine these are kind of things that you think of the prodigal son and he yearned to feel, fill his belly with the pods that the pigs would eat. And these things that the pigs ate were not, wouldn't provide any nutrition for a human. Uh, but they would make you feel like you're not hungry. Gene, what were you going to ask? You know, I'm not sure. He doesn't describe it. And again, one of the things we sort of wrestled with is how long is he out there? But one thing we do know from his description is he is, he, he's, he's kind of skin and bones. He's probably eating something, uh, you know, but because uh, he's not starving to death. Uh, but I don't know what he's eating at this point. He doesn't have anything. What's that? Yeah, he had, yeah, but it, it also is related, as we're going to see at the end of this passage, it could be his, his health, the disease he has on his skin is, is taking its toll. All right, verses 5 and 6, more description of these young idiots is not only are they, do they live off-grid and lazy on purpose, but the community has already rejected these people. This is what he says, they're driven out of human company. So these are individuals that when they came into town, people would immediately stop them. What do you want? What do you need? Why not, get, get what you need and get out. You're not, they burned all their bridges within the, the relational connection, the relational community where, where Job had influence. They were shouted at as a, as a thief. And, and these, aren't, um, these aren't people who are merely treating people poorly. They're treating people based on the way that their reputation has been earned. The reason they're treated as thieves is because they've stolen stuff. This is not a, uh, this isn't because they were mi being mistreated. Their housing is in gullies of torrents. Now, why is a gully of a torrent a bad place to have a house? It tends to fill with water. That's why it's a gully. And generally, gullies like these, especially if uh, out near the Dead Sea, the, the gully will fill with water regardless of whether it's raining. In fact, the rain that fills that gully is likely far away. It's up in the hills. And then you're unannounced. All of a sudden, you've got a flood on your hand. So, um, but the gullies of torrents are generally uninhabited, and nobody is going to fight with you over building your structure in a gully. You know, but if you build your structure somewhere else, someone may come to you, no, this is my plot of land. You build it in a gully, you say, go ahead, have at it. It's really, really nice when there's no flood. It's, it's great to be, it's sheltered, the wind is kept off of it. Have you seen these, uh, you know, in Mexico, I think they call them arroyos, or, yeah, and they're or washouts, and so if you're down in them and it's windy, it's really not, well, they're sheltered, and you know, and, and animals and wildlife use them, so provide some. Uh, but, but again, it's every now and then the water gets turned on and your, your house is gone. And uh, so these, these fools live in gullies of torrents. They live in the holes of the earth and of the rocks uh, because they have no interest in doing what's necessary to establish a home uh, and take care of land and, and generate food. And trade with others to have a. Well, it looked like you were going to say something, Pam. What, what what's on your mind? Yeah, it could be. We yeah, yeah. Pam is referring to En Gedi, which is the place where David hid out, and the the rock uh, gets hollowed out when the, it rains, and the water flows down the face of the rock, and then the the water slowly eats out openings in the face of the this this rock. And um, I think it's limestone, could be. And, uh, and so it creates these very nice caves that you can stay in. David stayed in one that uh, had, a, had a fence built around the opening of the cave because what the shepherds would do is they would bring their sheep into the enclosure. And so the sheep were protected and constrained and the shepherds could go in to the cave and have some shelter. So they could sleep and get some rest. They knew the sheep were okay. And they had a place that had some, some shelter. And, uh, and then, of course, Saul used that because most shepherds at the end of a long day need to use the restroom. And Saul knew that all these caves became facilitated with the appropriate equipment, and the, meaning the whole dug and the wood, piece of wood laid across in the right place. And, and that's where David cut off a corner of his robe 
while, while Saul was, well, taking a rest, maybe. It depends on your translation, uh, relieving himself. So anyway, that's, yeah, these are the caves they likely lived in. They're not, pla- they're not bad places to live, uh, but, but they're not good places to live if you want to grow a crop. They're good places to sleep, we might say. Uh, but if you want to have a life where you're working the ground, uh, that's a very strange thing. The other thing is we might think about is thinking about how Job at least was recorded and written down in the time of Solomon. If you look at the book of Judges, which the, 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 the occasion of Judges is likely after Job was alive, but before it was written down. Does that make sense? So it was uh, still in the oral uh, transmission phase. It was always a negative thing for the people of Israel when there was an invader like Moab because they would have to hide out in caves and whatnot. That was always the, the Moab, the Moabites would settle across the land like gnats or, or dust. And then the, the Israelites would have to hide in caves while the Moabites would take all of their crops. So it was always a sign of judgment if the Israelites were living in caves. And, and, and there may be a little bit of a hint of that here. These are people that are judged because of their life is a, way, a life of waywardness. And uh, their homes are where uh, they can find them. Verses 7 and 8, among the bushes they bray. Uh, what brays? Donkeys, yeah, so not being polite, calling them donkeys. <laughs> See how I self-edited there? You know, I always like to pat myself on the back when I... They're calling them, them donkeys. The, under the nettles, they huddle together. That's not a pleasant place uh, to try and get some warmth. A senseless and nameless brood. The senselessness here is not mental incapacity or limitation. It's foolishness. An unwillingness to think wisely about how life ought to be led to the glory of God. And a nameless brood means a, could mean one of two things. Number one, nameless could mean that they're so insignificant in the, in the community where they live that nobody knows who they are, nor do they care. Or it could be, because this is the reality in, in many places, these are people who just never were given a name because of the life they lived. You know, this is, they didn't have a close enough connection with a family unit for someone to provide them a name. They don't have a, a name, you know, where normally, what, what is it in the Old Testament when you Isaac, son of Abraham. So your name is your identity, and it connects you with a people. And they, the, these individuals have none of that. And remember, this isn't. This is because of their waywardness, their foolishness. Now, why are we describing all that? Because these are the people mocking Je- Job. These are the people who are making fun of Job and his his terrible condition. So. Part of Job's total humiliation is the reality that his humiliation is coming from the worst of all places. The people on the lowest possible rung of the social structure are, are, are mocking Job. Because wouldn't it be okay if, if the, the prince of the town was mocking Job? Wouldn't you sort of expect that? I mean, he's like, yeah, he's the, he's the prince. He's going he's gonna to look down on people who, who are in Job's kind of situation. But in this case, he's, Job is being mocked. Uh, by the by, the fools. Um, in fact, these are individuals who, before Job's um, humiliation occurred, would never have would never have treated Job because they know that that could cause a major problem in their life. For them to treat Job with with his reputation, his influence in the community, um, and uh, they would never would have done that. But Job's humiliation is so complete, they have no. Uh, Nothing that holds them back from giving full vent uh, to their mockery. We might say it this way. Whatever the lowest in society could be considered, at this point, Job is saying, I'm lower than that. Whatever, whatever you might think in society, and I'm not saying these structures are right or wrong. It's just what is. Whatever you might say is the lowest possible rung in culture, in social structure, Job says, that's above me at this point. That's pretty bad. So it's humiliation here is more than just his, the stuff that happened to him, what he's experiencing in, uh, in the community adds to it. All right, let's look at verses 9 through 15. Let's, let's talk about the, the, the manner of the mocking that's coming from these fools. So let me read verses 9 through 15. 
Job says, And now I have become their song. I am a byword to them. They abhor me. They keep aloof from me. They do not hesitate to spit at the sight of me. Because God has loosed my cord and humbled me, they have cast off all restraint in my presence. On my right hand, the rabble rise. They push away my feet. They cast up against me their ways of destruction. They break up my path. They promote my calamity. They need no one to help them. As through a wide breach they come, amid the crash they roll, terrors are turned upon me. My honor is pursued as by the wind, and my prosperity has passed away like a cloud. So the manner of the fool's mocking. First way they mock him is in song. They, I've become their song to him. So he's saying they've, they've written nursery rhymes about being a Job you know, the, in, in mockery. You know, so, the, so Job is, has become the, the theme of their, their, their songs that they sing in mockery. Uh, you know, if they're making fun of somebody, uh, they're going to sing a song of, of the calamity of Job. And they would do this openly in his presence. More than that, his name has become a byword to them. And one way of saying this is his name has become a swear. Is what they would do is you would, you would call someone a Job. You know, you know, somebody, you can see the kids on the playground and, and, and the kid strikes out at the kickball. I don't know if they did kickball back then, but strikes out at the kickball and the and his teammates, oh, you're such a Job. It's a, to- it's a dick. You know, so it's being called, you know, his name is now being used as a, a byword, a slight, a curse, a way of saying something negative about somebody. And so they've taken his good name and, and derided it into something that's a mockery, which is just incredible. And, and this is the, the, the humiliation he's experienced. It gets worse. In verse 10, it says, they abhor me. They hate him. The fools hate Job. It's not just the mocking you might expect from, from morons and idiots. I don't mean to offend you. I don't, and these guys are dead, so I can't offend them. It, and, and this isn't the mocking of young people that are just full of jest and, don't, and they're crass. And maybe we might expect a sort of mocking if, if somebody's had too much to drink. And yeah, we start saying stupid things. This kind of foolishness maybe to some degree is accepted, but in this case, we've got these, these young wayward fools. They're, they have hatred toward Job. And, um, and in a sense, in their arrogance, they consider their life better off than Job's. Their life is better. And this kind of gets back to what we mentioned earlier. Likely, it's likely, it seems to me, they take great delight in the fact that Job, who had done so well for himself, has and fallen on such hard times. And then finally, it says they spit on him, which, of course, is the height of an insult, to, to spit uh, at the side. When they see Job, they, it's almost, number one, it's insulting, it's degrading, of course, to spit on somebody. That goes without saying. But it's also a way of saying, you know, the mere sight of you disgusts me. You know, I want to get the, the smell of you out of, and the taste of you, of seeing you out of my mouth. So just terrible way they were uh, treating uh, Job. Verse 11, though, helps remind us that Job is, again, in case we have forgotten, he's not primarily concerned about the fools, although this describes his situation. The source of all of this is still one person. Who is that? It, this God did this. So God has loosed his cord and humbled me. They have cast off restraint. So Job is saying, God has put me in this position, and they have responded by casting off restraint with unmitigated humiliation. So this is where a group of young fools would gather around Job maybe, and somebody would say something insulting or spit on him, and now they got to try and top each other. they got to try and who can do the most degrading thing to Job. And you could imagine how that would would, uh, be a terrible thing. Uh, They're actively engaged. They push away my feet. They cast up against my ways of destruction. So they're actively engaged in trying to make Job's life as miserable as possible. Reminds me of a couple of occasions in uh, the Old Testament later on during Jeremiah and Isaiah's time, Ezekiel's times. The prophets would sometimes write judgments against uh, the Philistines, the Edomites, um, the, the Amalekites, the Ammonites, 
and uh, Assyria and Babylon. The two big ones at the end of the kingdoms of both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, of course, are Assyria first and then Babylon second. One of the things you'll see a, a couple of different places, especially about Assyria and Babylon, is God says to Assyria, you're a judge, because here's what I told you to do. I wanted you to go, Assyria, into Israel and conquer them and take them out of their land, and you took it too far. And then a similar prophecy is written towards Babylon. I told you to go in, and because they had disobeyed me, they were under my judgment, so I was going to take them out of the land. But you, you, you took it way too far. I didn't, you went in enraged. You, you should have just taken the judgment the appropriate amount of ways. So you see it kind of here with, with Job. God, for whatever reason, has decided to bring this calamity on Job. These fools are taking the opportunity of God's sovereign work to engage in, in this additional suffering on Job. And it doesn't mean that God didn't know it was going to happen or that he wasn't in it, but they've taken advantage of God's actions to uh, seek to humiliate and make Job's life as miserable uh, as, as possible. It's just really terrible. It's just really awful. But wait, it gets worse. Um, verses 13, we're not done yet. Verses 13 and 14, they promote his calamity, calamity Jane or something. They, they need no one to help them, meaning uh, when Job was in his full strength, these guys would have needed a whole posse to come in and try and do something to Job because Job had so much influence. He's saying, these guys who are totally weak have nothing, basically homeless idiots. I don't mean all homeless people are idiots. They're homeless and they're fools. With no restraint, they can come and make someone like Job's life totally miserable. And so this is a description of uh, ongoing, over-the-top antagonism. So verse 14, as through a wide breach they come. So the word there is, 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 it's hard to know what word picture he's drawing. There's two possible pictures. Number one, it could be the, the breach in, the, in a city wall. So once a wall is breached, the invading army comes rushing in. If you want a great picture of that, think of any of the Lord of the Rings films where they break through the wall and then all of a sudden the orcs are coming into Helm's Deep or something like this, right? So they're rushing in. But the other way, this could be like a levee or a dam restraining water. Once there's a breach, there's no stopping it. Yet you're going to have to wait for the water empty and then rebuild the levee or the dam. So what we have to understand more details about these fools and their antagonism of Job. This wasn't just every other Friday. This, this, wasn't, this was an ongoing, nonstop avalanche of antagonism that never quit. They were just constantly, they had nothing else to do. There was nothing on TV. They had nothing else to do to entertain themselves. And so this is an, an ever-flowing uh, vitriol and, and harm that, that didn't, didn't seem to have any end to it. That's, that's what he's experiencing, this great humiliation from these, these young fools. And uh, verse 15, um, he says, Terrors are turned upon me. And here's an interesting phrase. It's hard to know exactly what he's getting at, but he says, My honor is pursued as by the wind. So we have another potential motive for these young fools. It could be, Number one, what we've talked about before, that because of their envy, they just took great delight in humiliating somebody who used to be as important as Job was. Or they had a hope that maybe through their ongoing humiliation of Job, they would maybe gain some honor for themselves. That since Job at this point has been rejected by his entire community, maybe by uh, harming Job to a further degree, and uh, they would gain honor for themselves by... Uh, sort of accenting or encouraging Job's ruin. Maybe once he was dead, they would pursue over his, to take his land or his position. So um, the manner of the fool's mocking here in verses 9 through 15 is really, it's really debilitating to even think about it. So the harm from the fools on, uh, for Job is intentional. Uh, it's over the top. Um, this is not just mocking or leering that comes from, uh, have you heard this phrase, everybody, everybody likes to watch a train wreck. You know, like if a train wreck is happening, it's hard to look away. Like it's terrible, a train is wrecking. But there's a reason why you can watch a lot of train wrecks on YouTube. Because people, it's interesting. 
that was terrible. There's a train wreck happening. And then, you, but you can't look away because you don't see it that often. And so we might assume these fools are just like anybody, you know, uh, uh, what, what day was it? There was a wreck. We've had a lot of wrecks on Crater Lake Avenue recently. I forget what day it was, but there was a little rear end accident. And so down to one lane heading towards Maine and, and you're driving and, and now, now the lane's clear. Light's green and we're moving, but we're not moving very fast because apparently nobody has ever seen a car rear end another car. This is the most exciting thing. Some people, this is, they've got to slow and, and look, the back end of one of the cars has a dent. And then, I know this is going to blow your mind, Kevin, the front end of the other car had a dent, and the airbags, the airbags were deployed, this is, I know this is, I used to be a claims adjuster for an auto insurance company, so this is something I saw every day of the week, and I just, can we, I just want to go home, if you want to see pictures of cars, like, you can, you can go to YouTube and watch dash cam videos all night long, if you like watching red cars, so let's get this moving, so we might, well, that's what these young kids are like, here's this sick, humiliated, old man sitting in an ash heap. You know, it's fun on a Friday to go make fun of the, the, the crazy old guy who's lost everything. Kind of the, can't, but that's not what was going on here. That's not these, you might you chalk that up to kids being kids. The, stupid, maybe they should get smacked upside the head, but they're just being kids. This is mocking that is fueled by hatred, envy, vengefulness. And we might even suggest, knowing how the book started, that this is satanic, you know, because here we have this vitriol directed towards the one that God called righteous, you know, so that's because the description of what's going on here just sounds, who, who would do such a thing? And uh, now the evil of the human heart is, uh, knows no end, but it doesn't hurt uh, when you've got Satan egging you on. And I, I think that might be the case uh, here. All right, let's uh, continue on. Uh, let's see, what verses are we up to? Verses 16 through 23. The humiliation of the fools is bad, but now Job is going to describe some of the details of what's going on with him physically, and now we're going to realize the, the, the fools might not be such a big deal. Maybe it distracts him from this for a minute. So let me read verses uh, 16 through 23. Now my soul is poured out within me. Days of affliction have taken a hold of me. That affliction there, so we know he's talking really about his physical condition. The night racks my bones. The pain that gnaws me takes no rest. With great, excuse me, with great force, my garment is disfigured. It binds me about like the collar of my tunic. God has cast me into the mire, and I've become like dust and ashes. I cry to you for help, and you do not answer me. I stand, and you only look at me. You have turned cruel to me. With the might of your hand, you persecute me. You lift me up on the wind, and you make me ride on it. You toss me about in the roar of the storm. For I know that you will bring me to death and to the house appointed for all the living. So he starts by saying his days are filled. His soul is poured out within me. He says, his days are filled with sadness and mourning and pain. So the pain is likely emotional, as he's described throughout the book, but it's also flowing from physical pain and discomfort. So he says that all of his day is filled with affliction that gri grips him always. You know, so I, I know many of us have been in that condition or have been uh, either now or have been before where you just can't get comfortable. And uh, the pain uh, it, it seems unyielding, and that's kind of the situation he's in. There's no, there's no way for it to, to stop. Remember at the beginning of the book, it talked about how he had sores on his body, and he would scratch it with pottery, and you would imagine that maybe that provided some sense of, of relief. And, and, and you know what that's like uh, if you've ever had poison oak. Um, itching it or scratching it seems to provide relief till you stop, and then, and then it's worse. And, and, uh, and then going to bed is worse because it, yeah, you know, the, the sheets hit it, and now it itches even more. And, and, of course, this is more than poison oak would just itches. These are sort of sores that have some sort of affection in them. So his physical condition is an affliction. He talks about the nighttime, his 
the pain isn't just merely on the, on, on the outside. We would think with boils that maybe his, his pain is primarily a, a skin affliction, which is bad enough. But what he's describing is pain that's going into his bones. Uh, the, the pain that gnaws me takes no rest. So he's describing the pain that he's experiencing in going into his person, and it's like something is chewing on him, gnawing. Isn't that what gnawing means? So he, that's the, the ongoing experience of, um, of his, his physical uh, condition. So days of affliction, uh, unable to get comfortable, something gnawing on him. And uh, verse 18, uh, uh, he, he talks about his, his garments not fitting properly. It's difficult to know exactly what he's, he's saying. One thing it could be is his garments aren't comfortable on him. You can imagine with any kind of skin condition, it would be difficult to wear anything that might be comfortable. But there's also this sense that it's constricting. And uh, one commentator indicated that it's, he feels constricted, not merely physically by his garments, but that he knows this is from God, and he feels, he feels the judgment of God. Uh, maybe the, the garment we would most associate with what he's describing here is a straight jacket. I've never had one on. Um, I don't, are those even used anymore? I would hope not. Those don't seem very nice. But that's kind of what this is. He's feeling so constricted. And, and this is the beginning of this section where he's going. He's describing his phys- physical condition, and he's connecting it with the actions of God again. So he's saying, God is constricting me. Verse 19, God has cast me into the mire. Mire is just filth. So it doesn't have to be sewage, but it could be certainly muck. More than mud, it'd be mud that, you'd, that has, a, has an aroma to it, has, a, has aged to perfection, we might say. This is gross. It's intended to seem gross. You want me to move on? Okay, sorry, Pam. You know, I want you to read your Bible in full color and full sm- it's full smell of vision here. Um, not only that, but he, he's, he, God has plunged him into the mire and he's become like dust and ashes. And dust and ashes in the home are things you cast off. So if you, you sweep your home, you throw the dust, not back in the home, but you find a place where it's going to be gone. And your ash, once your wood is spent and the ash is done being useful, it's collected and it's put in some place that's out of the way that you don't, it's gotten rid of. You don't want it anymore. You don't want it anywhere near the house because, because ash settles everywhere. So, so Job is saying God has inflicted him. God has constrained him. God has plunged him into the muck. And now God has cast him aside the way you would cast aside your sweepings or the, the ash at the bottom of your cook, your cook stove or your cook fire. And, and so this, so Job's got this physical pain, which is ongoing and unrelenting. He's got this humiliation that's occurring from these young fools. And he's got the recognition that God has cast him aside, or at least that, that's his perception. We're going to learn from God that, that God never did cast him aside, but that's, his, that's what he's experiencing in his perception in this moment. And... <clears throat> So verse 20, I cry to you for help, and you do not answer me. So anybody felt that way? I mean, you wouldn't be at a Job study if you'd never felt that way before. It, you know, this is, I really love these kind of verses. On the one hand, it helps us recognize that that particular perception is universal. That, that's, that's a thing, and that's not, a, that's not something relegated to the immature or ill-informed or the weak. Strong, mature, well-informed, well-educated, people who've been through lots of stuff and are really mature in their faith. I don't know where those people are, but, you know, these people, they still feel this way from time to time, where they see God and they feel like he's absent and they have a sense of abandonment. So on the one hand, this is really, really helpful because uh, we should recognize when we're, because what happens when we're feeling, when we feel that way is we assume nobody else has ever felt that way, and so therefore I'm particularly bad at following God. That's, that's a, I, I might suggest that's a, a satanic tool that the enemy uses to try and separate us and make us feel isolated. Since I feel this way and nobody else has ever felt this way, I must be particularly bad, so I might be the first one that God actually did abandon. Even though we, maybe if you read your Bible, you say, well, God doesn't abandon people. I think there's a verse that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Is that a verse? 
Okay, it's in Hebrews. Okay, so that's a verse. I know it's a verse. I'm, anyway. Um, but even though we know that verse, we sort of come up with reasons why it doesn't apply to us. And so it's really helpful to recognize that this is universal. This is something that happens. However, it's also helpful to recognize when we read Job, from time to time, don't we want to just shake him? It's Job, come on, bro. I mean, serious. yes, it's bad. I, I don't want to minimize what's going on in your life, but, but you're good, you know. And so what's helpful is as much as you maybe want to shake Job from time to time, we should then, like, look at ourselves and shake ourselves. <laughs> no, God hasn't abandoned me. I just, I'm perceiving that way and that the feeling of it's real, it's true. Uh, but the, the feeling of it does not define the reality. What's the reality? God is unable to distance himself from you if you are in Christ. Right. Yeah, no, I wouldn't. I'm, I, I certainly wouldn't condemn him. I certainly wouldn't condemn myself or anyone else when we're in that position. That, that's, a, that's something we all go through, right? I, I don't think that's what you're saying. Oh, we are. Yeah, we are. And I, I think that's what's great is even though we can feel because of our circumstances, we feel like God is distant, we can know from the reality of Scripture that he couldn't possibly be closer. And the reason is because he was, because Christ, what Christ said on the cross, he my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So now in Christ, the forsakenness has already occurred. So it can't happen again because God is just. And so God cannot distance himself from someone who is in, in Christ. And, but it doesn't mean we always feel that way. It's not a problem with God, though. It's a problem with how we're perceiving reality. Yes, Pam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what Elijah said, I'm tired. Take me home. And what God do? He took him home. I mean, it wasn't that long after the chariots of fire showed up. He's like, oh, okay, you're retired. That's good. Jonah did too. And uh, God planted a plant that he killed. All right. Um, verses 21 through 23. He gets kind of harsh here. You have to, he's talking to God here in this section. You have turned cruel to me. With the might of your hand, you persecute me. You lift me up on the wind. You make me ride on it. You toss me about in the roar of the storm. Is Job wrong for talking to God like that? I know. Because that's what, he's, that's what yeah, yeah, yeah. It's God, so, oh, God didn't go, oh, my goodness, cover my ears. I'm so, yeah, he, you know, Job's being honest. Now, Job is being honest about his, his experience and his perception of reality. But he's probably not being very accurate with how God is treating him. And certainly, it feels cruel, and it, it feels like he's riding on a storm. But God has something else he's up to that if Job could see the full story, he might assess it differently. He might say, this is really hard now. But if he could see the whole story, he might not look at it the same way. So, oh, the isolation is, is the worst. Yeah, and he's got three friends that made the isolation worse by being near him. Gene. Right. Yeah, and so so we, we talked about this a little bit, but it's be worth being reminded. So who is doing the thing? Because Job, God described Satan as inciting him, but then he says, go out and do, and, and so Satan did the thing. Um, and so... Did God smite Job or did Satan smite Job? I, and I, I would suggest it didn't matter because Satan can't do anything unless God let him. And in the end, God's plan was God's plan was done. And so God intended for this to occur, and Satan was one of the ways in which he accomplished what he intended to. God's responsible. But not in the way that we're thinking, so God owes Job an apology. He doesn't. But God is the acting agent. Um, and, and we talked about this quite a bit, so I don't want to make too much review. But we, we emphasize here that God never does anything evil, and everything he always does is not only good, it's the goodest that could be done in that moment. 
but we would probably define those things differently than God from time to time. And um, Job is driven, brought to repentance even. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, no, he doesn't repent of everything. Yep, yeah, you're absolutely right. I do hear what you're saying, yeah. So his repenting is those places where he consigned to God injustice. Right. But most of what Job has to say about God is accurate, and God's going to affirm that later. He's going to say to his friends, you didn't speak true of me the way my servant Job did. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, why did we do this for 30 chapters? Yeah, why did we do this for 30 chapters? Here's, a, here's, a, here's one of the reasons, is this is what people did for fun. Now, we wouldn't call it entertainment, but you eat dinner, and maybe you've got a little bit of time before the campfire dies out or the cook fire or the warming fire dies out, and you're going to have Dad. Dad, tell us the story of Job. And, and so this is how, number one, their history was held, and secondly, this is what you did to pass the time, is you, you, you shared these stories of tell us again about the Red Sea, tell us again about Abraham, tell us again about Job. And, and number one, it retained the history. So um, if it were a three-chapter book, they would need to buy board games, I guess. I don't know. But So part of it is this is what they did. We're, this is, we call this long-form narrative poetry. So it's telling a story. But, it, but it's a poem. And what's really hard about Job, and I think we've talked about this, but I'm glad you brought it up again. It only makes sense if you read the whole stinking thing. Because if you just pick a chapter of Job, say you just, out of your devotional has you on a Bildad chapter. You know, now Bildad says some stuff that sounds pretty good, but then when you really look at it, he's, it's not all very good. So it's this long form story that if you haven't read all 42 chapters, the whole thing doesn't really make any any sense, but <laughs> it already is, yeah. So I, you know, we can. That's one of those things we can take up with God. My son, my son was asking me. Uh, he was asking about God's sovereignty, and uh, this is the little one. This is the ten, the ten year old. No, the older kids. No, they're gonna. They've got school and basketball. No, the younger ones, <clears throat> and. Uh, he said somebody brought it up at school that, you know, we're very lucky to live in this country. And I said, well, you know, as a matter of fact, I, I agree with that. We, we just enjoy benefits that many people have never, never had. Yeah, I said even the, the poorest among us here really have many benefits uh, that many places don't have, and, and that's really good. And so it says, because I think I made some sort of spiritual comment like a dad maybe ought to from time to time. I said, you know, I, I just think we're, God has really been kind. He didn't have to. He's just been nice to us. You know, and we shouldn't enjoy that. And so he pipes up and says, but why doesn't he do that for everybody? I don't know. I, don't wanna, I was trying to do something nice, be a father of the year for a moment, and you've ruined it. So I grounded him for a week. No, I didn't. I didn't. But that's what I said to him. I said, you know, you're going to have to ask God when we get there. Because I have no idea why, why he doesn't do that for everybody. But that's what he's doing. And he's in charge. And that's one thing I maybe learned from Job is he gets to do what he wants. And he's, you know, um, we can ask about him when, when we get there. So I don't know why Job is so long. Maybe it's to help us experience the suffering of Job is reading it for such a long time. That's right, yeah. That's good. No, that's, that's fair. Thank you, Michael. What, what verse are we on? 21, uh, Job wants to die. 
verse 23, 21, 22, and 23, he really brings to the culmination what he thinks God is doing to him, which is being cruel and punishing him. Verse 23, I know you will bring me to death to the house appointed for all the living. So he knows everybody dies, that, and that's true. Everybody dies. Every person will go home to the grave. So the Sheol, was, everybody will at some point go to the grave. Now, the biblical viewpoint is everybody, everybody dies, but the human, the person being made in the image of God endures. So the, the being made in the image of God means death is not the end. And so Job here is talking generically about death being, that's where you go to your home, which is the grave, whatever's, whatever's next. And Job expects to die soon. In fact, he may be hoping for that you might, you might be hoping in fact we know from one of the chapters he was looking forward to dying so he could finally have a conversation with god about what's up let's figure this out we, let's go toe to toe and so he's not necessarily depicting between the righteous experiencing relationship with god forever and the unrighteous experiencing rejection from god forever he's just simply saying everybody goes to the grave yeah and what's, what's absolutely true about the grave is that it's the great equalizer. Everybody gets a certain number of years on this planet, and everybody has different experiences, because important in this chapter has been social structures, especially the last two chapters. Prior to this, he was talking about his nobility. In this chapter, he's talking about his humiliation. So in culture, every culture, there's social structures, and the grave, those are all erased. As soon as, as soon as you walk across that threshold, you are now dead, and all of this stuff from before doesn't matter for anything. None of it counts. You don't take anything over. There's nothing you do here from that status standpoint that carries, that carries over. It's sort of that's the great reset. At that point, of course, we know from uh, looking at redemption through the Bible— Number one, where do you go from there? Do you go to the presence of God or do you go to separation from God? And then secondly, if you're going into the presence of God, what does your experience look like in the presence of God? And Jesus develops this and talks about if you want to have great influence and importance in the kingdom of God, what do you do here? If you want to be, fanta if you want to be awesome there, what do you do here? Yeah, yeah, you humil you're, you self humiliate. Yeah, wash feet. That was Jesus' example. You wash feet. The greatest in the kingdom of God will will humbly serve others. So that's the the means of attaining some sort of status. And of course, in the kingdom of God, the main thing is we get to be with Jesus. But but if we want to sort of think about social structures in the kingdom of God, then we look at our life here and we say, how do I self uh, self humiliate the way Christ? the way Christ did. And what Job is assessing here is, look, I one time was great, now I'm nothing, but when I get to the grave, it doesn't matter. None of that matters. And, and he wants, I know that God will bring me to the house of living. So I think he's looking at his physical condition, we'll, we'll see in these closing verses. I think he, he thinks he's almost done physically, and he knows that all of this ridiculousness, both the nobility as well as the humiliation, is soon uh, going to end. Um, just summarize this. I don't know if you'll agree with this or not. While Job's sufferings are numerous and specific, so here's some of the sufferings we've mentioned before. He's po impoverished. He's filled with grief for the loss of his children. His health is failing. He's lost his reputation. He faces ongoing mocking and mistreatment. But in the end, Job, Job I said Job. Uh, speaking of Job, well, did they just go out? Oh, that's weird. <laughs> okay. Uh, when uh, Job knows the cause of all these things is God, which also means God is the only one who can provide meaningful relief from these things. So while on the one hand it may feel very, very bad to say God has caused all these things, on the other hand it's very, very helpful because we know he has, he's the one that has the remedy. And so these, these young fools that are mocking him, there's nothing, they can't fix anything. 
It would do him, I mean, they could stop mocking him, but he's still going to be in his condition. The only one who can truly find re, uh, re, remedy his situation is God himself. Okay, verses 24 through 31, <clears throat> Job here is going to assert that he's experienced injustice. So let me read to the end of the chapter 24 through 31. Yet does not one in a heap of ruins stretch out his hands and is in his disaster cry for help? Did I not did not I weep for him wh whose day was hard? Was not my soul grieved for the needy? But when I hoped for good, evil came, and when I waited for light, darkness came. My inward parts are in turmoil and never still. Days of affliction come to meet me. I go about darkened, but not by the sun. I stand up in the assembly and cry for help. I am a brother of jackals and a companion of ostriches. That's a bad thing. Uh, my skin turns black and falls from me, and my bones burn with heat. My lyre is turned to mourning, my pipe to the voice of those who weep. So he, first of all, in verse, the first couple of verses, he, he, he makes a statement that everybody would assume to be true. If somebody is in trouble, don't they call for help? G generally, yes. He says, so people, when they're in ruin, they call for help. And verse 25, what he says is, when people called for help, didn't I grieve for them? So all he's saying here, now in the next chapter, he's going to develop this much further. The next chapter is basically Job's resume of goodness of how he treated people before. That's kind of what this is alluding to, but really all he's talking about here is what goes on on the inside. So if you see somebody with a, with a cardboard sign at the exit of Walmart, which is common, you might have a number of reactions to that individual that might come from a number of different places. There might be times that based on what you're assessing and what you're seeing, you would feel moved. You'd feel compassion. This is a person in a, in a tough spot. But there might be other things about the situation that make you feel cynical and jaded. And why is this person down here? Um, they probably put that sign in their pocket and get in a Mercedes that's hidden around the corner or something like this. You know, we, we assess, and, and these judgments aren't certainly are not always accurate, but what Job is saying is when he saw somebody in need, he was moved with compassion. That was his inner response. And remember, for someone having a dialogue with God, uh, we would assume, well, everybody's going to say that. Oh, I feel so bad for the needy. Well, but he's having a conversation with God, and God doesn't get fooled. And so he's, he's saying to God, remember, when I saw someone needy, I, it, it broke my heart. And so he knows God knows what's going on in his heart, so he expects God to affirm this. And so he's saying, since I responded this way in my inner person, and, and this is really, really important because the next chapter he's going to talk about what he does on the outward. But you know, you can help people outwardly and not care about them. That's possible. You can, you can feed people and clothe people and donate at the office and do all kinds of things and not care. In fact, you might do that because you don't care, and it helps sort of soothe your conscience, you know? Right, verse 26, yeah. And that's what he's saying, is my inner person was moved, but when I hoped for good, nothing came. Nobody helped. Yeah, it got worse. And who is he crying out to? He's crying out primarily to God. So what he is saying is, God, when I saw somebody in trouble, at minimum, I was moved by it. On the other hand, when I'm in trouble, you can't seem to be bothered. You, you know, that's sort of his... His, his assessment. When I hoped for good, evil came. And, and, and that's a common experience. It's like Job's prayers are too real. They're bothersome. Um, when you pray for something that you think is really important and helpful and spiritual and you think God's on your side and then it gets worse, or something worse happens, certainly none of us have had that happen before, right? You pray for something and, and um, Lord, I pray the car would start. It doesn't start, and it gets repoed. Okay, this is not what the prayer was. This is not where I thought the prayer was going. And um, this is what he's saying. When I waited for light, darkness came. This is how he's, he feels his relationship with God is, in, is interacting. In verse 27 and 28, he's describing both his physical and emotional condition. His inward parts are in turmoil. So number one, physically, he's troubled. Remember, he's described his pain. But this is also compounded with his emotional struggle, and these two things work together. 
we all know chronic pain or any significant pain affects how we process things emotionally. His inner part, his days of affliction have come to meet him. I go about darkened, but not by the sun. And we've talked about this before. Likely his skin condition has infected to some degree. And, and um, he stands up in the assembly to cry for help. Just think about this. What did he used to do in the assembly? Oh, he walked in and people stood up and, no, sit here, Job. No, sit here, Job. And, you know, can I get you a, what's your favorite cold beverage, Job? You know, and everybody deferred to him. But now he's the beggar. He's crying out to his community. Can, can anybody help? And what's interesting is it seems like they weren't responding uh, favorably. And he's saying this to God. He's saying, look what you've done, God. It used to be the assembly deferred to me. Now they won't even listen to me. Uh, when I cry out to them in my, in my trouble. Now we'll get to the jackals and ostriches. Basically, we're saying he's living out, you know, he's in some ways homeless. He's comparing himself to those young fools, meaning uh, there's two ways this could be viewed. Number one, he's living outside among the animals, which is likely the case. I don't think you want to live among jackals. The other one, which I find more entertaining, is he's referring to his three friends. Is, look, I've got the jackal and the ostriches here. One is rude. The other one's not too bright. You know, I don't know if that's what he was, if he's referring to his three friends. Verse 30, he, my skin turns black and falls from me. My bones burn with heat. You could just imagine the feverish condition he was under. And there's no ibuprofen, you know, to kind of. <clears throat> Verse 31, he talks about his song of mourning. And one commentator makes note, what this means is his, <clears throat> his, Grief and cries have been so significant and so lengthy, he's losing his voice. This, he's become raspy with his, with his cries of anguish. My lyre is turned to mourning, my pipe, the voice of those who weep, and now he's been weeping and crying out so much, his voice uh, is almost uh, shot, which is good. There's only one chapter left, so it's good that he's run, run the course. Um. <laughs> All right, three applications and um, not really applications, more ways. And you've probably already thought through this a little bit as we were going through this. I want three ways that this sort of uh, preview of a com coming attractions for our Savior. Um, let's talk about Job's health a little bit, thinking about Jesus. How, do, how was Jesus' health at the end of his life? Not great. So um, Jesus was crucified. Uh, on the cross, of course, that's not comfortable. There's no comfortable position on a, on a cross. It's intended to be painful the entire time and to increase in pain over time. So the longer you're on a cross, the longer it gets, the more painful it becomes because of how you have to, I don't know if you heard that, you have, to, you have to use the strength of your legs to be able to stand up, to put enough weight up, to be able to breathe. Then you get fluid on your heart because your arms are out. And of course, you're putting force down on your feet, which have a spike through them, and all of this causes all kinds of uh, pain. There's also just the physical torture he went through with the, the flogging and the beatings uh, up to. So Jesus, who would, who would Jesus say caused all of his mistreatment physically? His father. Is the wrath of God on the son uh, that he might take upon himself the punishment that we deserve. You know, so it's, it's God redeeming us, the Son redeeming us by voluntarily working together, one sending, one dying. And so this is one of the ways that we can say, well, it troubles us to think God would do something to Job and it could be considered not evil. Well, is there anything the Father did to Christ that was evil? Absolutely not. The Father would never do anything evil, first of all, and never toward the son, the son voluntarily endured the wrath of God that should have been directed towards us. And so the difference we see between Job and Christ is Jesus humbly submitted to the mistreatment to the glory of the father. And so that's if you say, well, what Job, what should have Job done? I don't, I don't know if there's a way to do it differently. If you're just, a, you know, outside the power of God, there's just no way. But Jesus shows us what that looks like. It's a voluntary submission. The, the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane really captures it the, the most clear. Not my will, but yours be done. And we really don't see a prayer like that from Job. Not my will, except at the end when he's moved to repentance. 
I've spoken once, I will not speak again. I spoke of things I did not understand. And, and he just sort of leaves it at that. So one thing we can see in Job's suffering, when we look at Jesus' suffering, which I might suggest was worse, um, is Jesus voluntarily submitted to it. And again, it was the work of the Father, accomplishing the, the glory of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through the redemptive work. Interestingly, God is also going to use Job for redemptive work for his friends. So this suffering servant Job is going to seek redemption of his friends through a sacrifice and a prayer at the end of Job. Right. He completed the job through his suffering. Yep, the suffering was intentional. Um, all right, looking at Job's humiliation, talking about the mocking. Was there any mocking of Jesus at the end of his, during Passion Week? What were some of the, what were some of the ways that Jesus was mocked? Yeah, if you're the son of God, come down. We'll believe you. Come down, yeah. Crown of thorns, mocking his, his kingdom, yeah. What other? Yeah, uh, yeah, betting for his underwear, his, his garments, yeah. Yeah, corn thorn, yeah, that's two points. You guys have to split the points on that. Angela said that one. So they spit on him, yeah. Yeah, call angels down from heaven and... Um, when he starts, uh, he said something, Eli, Eloi, Laba, Sabachthani, and hey, oh, give him, see, maybe he's calling Elisha. Maybe he's going to do a magic trick. I mean, it's kind of, yeah. What's the worst, the, what's the worst one? It's in the Psalms, and so this is why I think it's the worst one. Yeah, that's in the Psalms too, so good. The kiss from Judas is terrible. Because remember in the Psalms, he says, oh, if it would have been an enemy. But it wasn't. It was someone who shared my bread at my table. So someone who had eaten with Jesus and walked with Jesus walked up and gave him a kiss, and he just, Judas was done. He was, remember, the Bible describes him as possessed by the devil. I don't know what his facial expression was, but and it was dark, but I would imagine just a bit of a, a grin he was trying to suppress because he was, he hated this guy at this point. Now he's going to have, apparently have some sense, he's going to have some sense of remorse because, yeah, he, he hung himself poorly, Um I say poorly because the rope broke and he fell down and burst open. You've read the book, yeah. Uh, so Jesus' humiliation, he's mocked at the beginning of his trial, punches him, who hit, who hit you? The Praetorian guard whipped him. They dressed him in clothes, in royal robes. Um, how many of those people were beneath him? Young fools. All of them. He's, li he's, he's eternal. He has never not been. And all of these people mocking him are things he's made. That, and so, so we just look at, the, at what Job has experienced, and we look to our Savior, and we see what that looks like. He endures the mocking because he wants to endure for uh, redemption. Uh, one last thing. Job's hope here at the end of this chapter is his death. Job looked forward to death maybe as a relief. And I think many of us do from time to time. It depends on our age. You know, the older we get, the more we say, you know, a day is coming. When you're younger, you don't like to think about it. Many of us don't like to think about death. I mean, uh, I still like my favorite quote from someone who attends church years. I don't mind death so much. What bothers me is what's between here and there. That's what bothers me. I don't know what that looks like. And, uh, um, and, and Job was looking forward to death as relief, but also to claim his justice from God. He had his claim ticket. He wanted to show up to God and show God he was mistreated uh, by God. Interestingly, Jesus was not looking to death for relief. Jesus never was looking for relief because he wanted to endure the exact amount of mistreatment necessary to properly account for the sin of humankind. That's why at a certain point in time, he said, it is finished. And he wasn't just quoting scripture. He's just, nope, it's done now. So now, and, and remember, Jesus wasn't killed. He gave up his spirit. So Jesus moving into death was not to seek relief. He was not seeking relief, which is what Job was. Jesus was going into death to kill it. He had to die so he could raise. And once he's raised, death lost. It's over. So he was not going in to seek relief. He was going in to finish the job. So Jesus dies and now it's on. And he's raised from the dead, and death has died. He has no claim over anyone who is in Christ. So he raises from the dead. And that's the difference. Job wants to die to uh, 
experience relief and maybe claim justice from God. Jesus, who has a much greater claim of justice from God, now nah, I'm going to go to die. I'm going to die so I can defeat it. I really just like the way. I, I just felt like it was important maybe to look at the way Job has processed his suffering, and then look at how our Savior does it. And I'm not expecting us to be like all of a sudden we can do everything like Jesus did. However, like Diana has mentioned, we do have the Spirit. And so what we can do is look at these two things, and this is how I like to think about it. When I'm acting like Job, which I only do on weekends and weekdays, when I'm acting like Job, I give myself a break. Because guess what? That's what life's like. We act like Job. And I'm not going to beat myself up because I'm no better than Job. However, I also want to look at my Savior and be drawn toward Christ-likeness. Does that make sense? And, and this is how... We call this the tension of the spirit and the flesh. That's the um, Ephesians, or war with one another, or Romans, one of the two. It's a Pauline epistle, or war with one. So on the one hand, we're like Job and say, you know what, the grace, grace of God's sufficient. I'm like Job sometimes, I'm a bit of a whiner. And I'll whine for 30 chapters if I need to, <laughs> Michael. But other times I say, no, by the power of the spirit, I'm going to say, no, God is, is good and he is kind. I don't like what he's doing, but I know he's up to something important. And I'm going to want my heart to be pressed into the shape of my Savior's heart. And that, so that's just one of the ways I like to think about it. All right, any other comments or questions? Yeah, Kevin. I think you went to Disneyland. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. There's a number of ways that we can think about it coming from scripture uh one way to think about it is for him there was no passage of time he died and was raised you know for us of course we experience time but to assume that on the other side that you know uh, that time is working the same as it here does here probably is not safe to assume seeing as how jesus says before abraham before moses and who i am so he's saying, I'm still there to some extent. I don't know how that works exactly. But there's also a sense, you know, some of the scriptures, you know, there is a, you know, the Apostles' Creed says he descended into hell, that he went to hell and maybe even paid torment or he rescued some. Uh, I, I, yeah. Yeah I, don't, I, yeah, I don't know that, you know, that's where we, we have one passage that is sort of very hard to, I don't know, you know, I'm not going to, but you know, if that's what you think, it's good for you. I, that, that's not heresy, that's fantastic, you know. So I'm going to go with a strong, not real sure what he was up to. Is that helpful, Kevin? That, uh, that it wasn't much, of, that he went like to heaven, like he just sort of hung out in, because remember you've got, you know, one of the descriptions of the parable is Abraham's bosom. You've got the good side and the not good side. So once you know, he went to hell and he rescued some people, and, and, and then maybe he went to the good side, hung out with Abraham for a little bit. I'll see you today in paradise. But when's today there? Where's paradise? There's paradise, California. Or used to be till it. During on the cross. No, once once he said it's finished, the wrath of God in my I was was satisfied. Yeah, he didn't die for the to continue the punishment. The punishment phase, the punitive phase of that was done. Yep. Yeah. And, and Boy, we're asking some tough, what? Yep. Yep. From the third hour to the ninth hour, does that sound right? Mm -hmm. And the curtain and the curtain split. There was an earthquake and a bunch of people came into life. Let me pray. God, we thank you uh, for your love and your grace towards us. We thank you for your word. We do uh, thank you, Lord, for how much you provide your mercy and grace when our a difficulty moves us to respond many times the way Job and his friends do. But God, we would also pray that by your spirit, you give us the strength to respond the way our Savior does and to um, 
come to you in prayer and recognize not our will, but yours be done, Lord. And so, God, we give you the glory and pray that you would make us more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming.